So hello and welcome and thank you for joining us on It Is Written Canada for this panel discussion. And because we are on lockdown and we can't meet face to face, we are recording a Zoom panel discussion today. We feel so very honored to be working with such a distinguished number of God's servants to share the love of the Lord with you in this momentous time. Renee and I are joined with three distinguished Bible scholars, and um, they are Dr. Alan Chichester, who is the Director of Sabbath School and Children's Ministries at the Ontario Conference for Seventh-day Adventists. So welcome, Dr. Chichester. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here with you. And Dr. Barry Bassey, who's Adjunct Associate Professor in the School of Law for the University of Notre Dame in Australia, and also Director of Legal Affairs for the Canadian Council of Christian Charities. Welcome, Barry. It's great to be with you. We also have with us uh, Professor, Professor Kevin Burrell, uh, who is Assistant Professor of Religious Studies at Berman University in Lacombe. Uh, Alberta. So welcome, Kevin. Thanks for having me. Our aim is to have a discussion on the balance of religious freedom and national emergency, the delicate balance between rights and public order, national crisis and personal conscience. So we're going to be looking at some questions that have popped up on this topic. And uh, we want to ask you to type in your comments or any questions. Last week, I had people sending me emails and uh, had some discussion going back and forth. And, and we had a lot of views on this topic and the topic that we had last week, which was on um, the um, time of trouble and COVID-19. So this is a very um, important topic right now and uh, relevant to the time that we're living in. So we will take uh, any further questions that you might have uh, in our further panel discussions in the future. Uh, but before that, uh, I think we should have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. So let's begin with the word of prayer and then we'll dive straight into our questions. Kevin, I wonder if you could lead us in a word of prayer. Absolutely, my pleasure. Let's pray. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this privilege we have this morning to discuss this very important topic. And I pray that as we um, delve into this topic, you may give us enlightenment, help us to speak things that are relevant for this time and relevant uh, for the listeners, and uh, just bless our time together and make it fruitful. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So our discussion today, as Renee said, is on the balance of religious freedom and national emergency. Um, so this is a delicate balance between uh, rights and public order. So we have a national crisis and we have personal conscience. So um, I've, I've seen this question and, and comments on this question. And because Barry deals with this on a regular basis, this type of, of issue, I'm going to have Barry uh, address it for us. And, and within the, the legal context here in Canada, um, and kind of outline what, what we're talking about and, uh, and how you understand the topic, and perhaps some cases, some, some examples from Canadian law. Well, I can tell you that uh, Canada has a charter of rights that's been uh, put into law in, as of 1982. And there in the charter of rights, we have all kinds of uh, our what we call individual uh, freedoms and rights. We've got, you know, freedom of assembly. We've got um, freedom of religion and conscience. Um, and, and that's unique because there's uh, very few places in the, in the world that have as part of its, um, its charter or its constitution, the idea of freedom of conscience. We see a lot of freedom of religion, but in Canada, we have freedom of conscience and religion. Mm. Uh, so we have mobility rights, we have language rights, and so forth. But of course, in a time of national crisis, um, we also have uh, the ability to suspend those rights. And that is, in essence, what's happening right now. Mm. And across the country, there are um, many provinces that have limited, for example, uh, gathering limits. 
Uh, we got as high as uh, no more than 50 people can meet in uh, uh, British Columbia uh, to in Ontario now. It's uh, just as of uh, recently, uh, five, no more than five people can gather. Mm-hmm. Um, so we've got uh, a lot of stress now upon many religious communities who would normally on the weekends, um, you know, Friday for Muslim, Sabbatarians on Saturday, and uh, of course, uh, many others on Sunday, uh, would, would come together at their meeting houses. And now that's, that's no longer permitted. And what is happening is that uh, many people are using the internet as a means of live streaming a, a, a smaller group uh, for um, their church services and so on. And so then the struggle becomes, well, should we, should we then um, have a, um, uh, you know, what should we do about conscience when in a lot of religious communities is extremely important to be able to attend on a weekly basis. And so there's a lot of uh, stress that has developed uh, with respect to that. Not so much in Canada, but certainly in the United States, we've seen examples of religious leaders who've said, they're going to open their church on Sunday and, um, and that's it. Uh, even though uh, recently I heard of a case where a pastor was fined or at least charged uh, in violating the regulations there. And, uh, but he's still planning this coming weekend uh, to hold his church service. So um, how then do we balance this? And throughout Canadian law, we've seen uh, the courts trying to, um, ensure that there is a proper balance between uh, the public interest and the, um, uh, the rights of the individual. And we've seen cases, for example, the Hutterites uh, a number of years ago wanted to have an exemption from driver's license of having their picture taken. Mm-hmm. Went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said, well, because of the issue of identity theft and so forth, uh, that right has to be suspended because in the balancing of, of of the rights with respect to the need of the public interest. The public interest in that case uh, won out. Uh, We saw it as well in the um, Trinity Western University case recently with the law school, where again, the uh, court said that it was up to the law societies to decide whether or not they were going to uh, allow a discriminatory school uh, because of their views on marriage and so on. Uh, to have a uh, accreditation to be running a law school and, and that kind of thing. Um, and yet, we've also seen other situations, for example, where um, a Sikh boy who was uh, going to school in Montreal and wanted to wear his kirpan, which is a, a small uh, knife-like uh, instrument that would be uh, tied onto his uh, belt, and that is uh, part of a religious symbol uh, in the Sikh community, and the court ruled that there was no evidence of any uh, problem with respect to that. There's never been any violence with respect to the Kirpan over the many, many years uh, that Sikhs have been in Canada and so forth, and said, no, this is uh, permitted. Um, so, you know, so the courts have uh, always been trying to figure out how can we deal with the situation. And I would think that if a, if a case went of a pastor who was wanting to go to uh, have his church called together uh, in a time of a uh, uh, pandemic, my, my uh, understanding of the law would be that the court would very much uh, limit uh, that right to religious freedom in this case, given the nature of uh, the trial that the country is going through. And so fines, for example, that these provinces have set up are quite onerous. Alberta, for example, is... Uh, uh, up to $100,000 for violating that uh, um, regulation that says no more than 15 people in, in Alberta, at least right now. Of course, things change. Every day is like a week as far as uh, things changing based on the happenings on the ground. Uh, but we do see this challenge. And w- one of the things that um, I have been very mindful of in, in recent days as I'm watching this unfold is is the importance of us in our liberal democracy like Canada to be ever mindful of the importance of eternal vigilance as a um, Irish politician some years ago said, 
that the price that the Lord gave us for our freedom is eternal vigilance. And I think that is indeed what we still have to maintain, even though it's important for us to follow what the um, authorities are telling us with respect to um, you know, social distancing and all the rest of it. But we still got to maintain our careful watch over uh, ensuring that governments don't overstep uh, with respect to gaining more power. And we saw that uh, debate just uh, a week or so ago uh, in Parliament in Ottawa, where government was basically wanting to have uh, huge amounts of power for over 21 or 22 months. And the opposition said, no, we'll allow you six months, but we're not going to give you 22 months because we want to oversee where government is spending money and that kind of thing. And yet, so what we have is this struggle that uh, in a time of crisis, uh, there's, al there's always this push towards consolidating power. And uh, so that's where we have to be very mindful and careful as we go forward. Mm. Mm -hmm. Very good summation. Um, Dr. Kevin Burrell, um, you have some insights from scripture. Sorry, we can't hear you, Dr. Burrell. I think your microphone is off. Yes, it was muted. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> um, so with respect to what Dr. Bussey just said, um, certainly we have precedent in scripture that, uh, that warns us of the dangers of um, totalitarianism coming to, to the fore in a time of crisis. Um, a good example very early in scripture is found in the book of Genesis. And this is the story of Joseph. And um, we see where there's a, a crisis, an international crisis, a famine, um, you know, severe food shortage and people uh, needing to make sure that, you know, they, they, they are able to be sustained during this difficult time. And so we know the story well, Joseph comes to power and in coming to power, he um, immediately sets to work to ensure the well-being and the welfare of the state of Egypt and also those who are coming into Egypt. And so... Joseph, as a prudent leader now, begins to um, put measures in place to ensure that people can continue to, to, to enjoy certain freedoms mm -hmm. within, this, within this particular time, but also uh, ensure that uh, there's order and so forth. And in the process of all of his, his system that he puts in place, Joseph uh, hadn't foreseen certain what we would say unintended consequences. Mm -hmm. So, for example, he uh, institutes that the people would pay for their food with money. Uh, mm -hmm. the grain that had been stored for many years. And so they begin to, to um, pay for uh, the grain with, with, with money. They begin to buy from Pharaoh, as it were. But over time, uh, their money run, runs out. And so when your money runs out, what do you do? What's next? They begin to barter with their crops, mm -hmm. uh, rather with their, their livestock and their horses and their donkeys and so forth. So they barter off all of their, their, their assets, as it were. These are their work their work assets in the ancient context. And so they barter off all of that for food. And then the next thing that comes uh, after a year when all of that is expended, we see how um, Joseph then, uh, the people themselves offer their land and their bodies to Pharaoh uh, for food. So why should we starve? You know, uh, we have nothing else to barter. Take the land, take our bodies. And so ultimately uh, Pharaoh uh, unwittingly becomes this, this um, autocrat or, that owns everything, um, owns the people, owns the land, uh, owns the entire uh, uh, system of Egypt. And Pharaoh becomes um, very powerful uh, subsequent to Joseph's, to Joseph's um, uh, tenure. And so over time, that power that Pharaoh acquires during the time of Joseph, this time of crisis, uh, propels the Pharaoh to such a level that he becomes a quasi-divine being, as it were. Uh, in incrementally, Pharaoh begins to assume or assert certain uh, 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 power and authority, he begins to arrogate to himself authority that wasn't invested in him previous to, to Joseph, previous to this time of crisis. And that in part leads him to ultimately enslave the Israelites. 
um, in, a, in a unilateral way, as it were. So we see how this, and the state of Egypt becomes very wealthy, very rich, and Pharaoh becomes increasingly powerful to the point that he, the, the, the Egyptian, uh, Egyptian Pharaoh begins to become imperial in his, in his perspective and begins to dominate the nations around him and so forth. That is in part someone who comes to the forefront um, at a time of crisis, not, not with any deliberate intention, but the office of the Pharaoh becomes increasingly invested with this kind of authority. And I think that is prudent for our situation as well, in that uh, we are, especially of Seventh-day Adventists, we've been teaching for, for over 150 years that the crisis of the last, uh, of the last days uh, will be catalyzed by some crisis of, of some kind that will bring, uh, that will eventually, eventuate in the uh, violation of conscience of individual rights and the, 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 um, the uh, ascension of some kind of totalitarian uh, power. So we are indeed, as uh, Dr. Bussey would say, we are extremely vigilant at a time like this, uh, we have to respect certainly the laws of the land, but certainly on a case-by-case -case basis, we must be very uh, mindful of what governments are doing at any given time and be, be able to foresee potential uh, areas of, of conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. Oh, very well, very well put. Um, so what, what we're told in the scriptures, Romans chapter 13 gives us a clear outline that we are to obey authorities. Um, verse five of that chapter says for conscience sake. Mm. And so conscience is a part of that, um, very much so individual conscience, um, Acts chapter five, verse 29, Peter and the other apostles, they answered, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so as, um, Dr. Bussey was saying that, that, that we have people who are saying, well, God has told us to worship, so we need to go to church and worship together um, because we should obey God rather than men. Um, and so scripture gives us some direction as to where is that delicate balance? At what time should we, um, should we obey men and what, what conscience comes into it? And can in, in this situation that we are in right now, can we get guidance from scripture? Um, so... Uh, where can we go with that? I'm, I'm thinking of Leviticus 13, where there were laws of social isolation for someone who, was, who had a skin, contagious skin disease. And, uh, and that was good for all of society. It was good for a worshiping community. It was also good for the individual who had the skin disease. Um, you know, to, it was a loving act for him to withdraw from the community if it was contagious. And so we want to uh, follow the scriptures in, in, in maintaining that, that delicate balance, as, as we're talking about here, between personal conscience and social order and, uh, and, and how we can, we can obey God and men. And yet, where do we overstep the mark? We have to be careful with that. So I think in, in your case, in your summation there, uh, Dr. Uh, Kevin Burrell, that, that you had put together this, this view that Pharaoh had unwittingly uh, just accumulated more and more power. And I think of that, that statement, power corrupts, mm. but absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so we have to be very careful of that. Um, any comments from anyone? Well, I just say that... Um... You know, that, that comment, for example, uh, of Lord Acton, who is a, a British um, lord and uh, a Roman Catholic who um, was a very astute historian, uh, was, was something that I think we need to keep in mind. Um, what, we, what we need to be thinking about as well is that this current crisis is doing something unprecedented mm. in the sense that it is isolating people um, as never before. Like, I mean, it's one thing, as you mentioned, um, Pastor Mike, with respect to Leviticus, you know, you take the person, you isolate them. But now what's happening is the entire society is isolating individuals mm. from everyone else. So everyone is being isolated. And that's that's something that's that's very very different, and yet um, at least from the 
authorities, we, we understand that this is to be the most effective way in, a, in order to deal with the pandemic. But now I want to, us to think about something that has come from um, a student of history, a philosopher, and Hannah Arendt, who uh, wrote the book, uh, The Origin of Totalitarianism, says something that I think resonates with the situation we're at. In other words, what are the, um, what are the seedbeds? What are the contexts? What are the uh, possibilities where totalitarianism could come? And I love the example that Dr. Burrell mentioned because I think that's exactly uh, the kind of thing. It's, uh, it's kind of like a, an altruistic attempt to be able to save mankind and, and so forth. But here's one thing she says in her conclusion of her study of her book, which is phenomenal. I'm going to just quote, quote it here real quick. It says, what prepares men for toler totalitarian domination in a non-totalitarian world is the fact that loneliness, once a borderline experience usually suffered in certain marginal social conditions like old age, has become an everyday experience of the ever-growing masses of our century. And so she says that the, the merciless process into which totalitarianism drives and organizes the masses looks like a suicidal escape from this reality. And so you see what's happening now, it seems to me, is that, and she, she makes a, a distinction between loneliness and solitude. Solitude is that which you're by yourself, you're studying, you're thinking, you're not, you're not, you have no fear. You're just simply by yourself. You might be meditating, you might be all those things. But loneliness, that deep sense that you're all by yourself and a sense of great fear because you can't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. You can't even trust your neighbors. And it is in that kind of context, she, she maintains that totalitarianism was able to rise in the 20th century in the way that it did, anti-Semitic and all the rest of it, because it was the other, it was the scapegoat that caused all of the problems. Mm -hmm. And so this is part of the, the thinking that I think we've got to just kind of be mindful of, that as we see this situation unfold, we have really, really got to um, be mindful of not fear mongering, not blaming, you know, uh, different groups and all the rest of it. Um, I, I just saw an article um, this morning where in Germany, apparently there's a lot of um, uh, situations where neighbors are phoning the police on, on what their neighbors are doing in violation of the, of the lockdowns and all the rest of it. And it's becoming very, uh, you know, a very tense uh, societal moment over there. And uh, so, you know, it's trying to find that balance, trying to figure it out, saying uh, on the one hand this, but on the other that. And uh, we've just got to be constantly um, mindful that we don't get caught up in the, in the, in the fear factor that is um, currently, uh, you know, the talk that we, we are facing right now. There have been some suggestions that a global entity with power to enforce health and economic injunctions is needed to stop this pandemic and correct this looming recession. And uh, it's, it's interesting language that there's a global entity with power to enforce and it's needed. Um, and, I, and I guess that definitely touches a nerve uh, that, that are, we're very sensitive to. When we look back in history, we see that usually in a time of crisis, uh, it breed, it's a breeding ground for totalitarian regimes, as you, as you said, Barry. Um, and they come to the front of the room and people, they are looking for strong, decisive leadership at times like these uh, to, to feel safe. But the question always, I think, in the back of our minds should be, or maybe at the forefront of our minds is, Safety at what cost? Anything that threatens this, this personal freedom of conscience um, has to be guarded against. We have to be very, very careful about that. Uh, we see it in the, in the scriptures in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, 
where uh, we have a totalitarian dictator who sets up a, uh, you know, an, an image and those who don't bow down and worship the image are going to be thrown into the fiery furnace. And three boys say, we're not going to do it. They get thrown into the furnace. They survive. And the king is so amazed by these people that he then makes another dictatorial uh, <laughs> claim. And he says, anyone who doesn't bow down and worship the right God is going to be burned. And um, so you, you look at it and you say, well, the king's public confession of the true God, that was a good thing to do. But his endeavor to force his subjects to make a similar confession of faith is he, he overstepped. He exceeded his right as a temporal leader. And, uh, you know, it, it was not his right to force god does not force people to obey him he does not compel people and uh we are all free to choose whether we serve or we don't serve god so even making a law that says you are to serve the true god would be uh, a violation of personal conscience um dr chichester you were in the military you had a history uh, of being in the military and uh, you want to talk about that and and how you had to make a choice for for personal conscience sure I, I will be talking about that I just want to connect also with something which was mentioned by Kevin and by Barry that um, in the atmosphere in which we exist currently it uh, it is necessary for us to do programs like this and for people to be educated as to the necessity of religious freedom. Mm -hmm. because God has made all men free. And as Barry rightfully said, um, eternal vigilance is the price of freedom. We were created free, and that freedom presupposes the freedom to associate, the freedom to decide what religion I want to belong to, the freedom of speech. In my case, uh, I entered the military in my late teens, wanted to fly military aircrafts. And part of the condition of that as established by the government of my country was I had to do an entire military officer's course, which I did spend some time with the infantry. And then I was sent to the Air Corps, which is the name that is used for our Air Force in Guyana. It is during that time that my country uh, seemed to be approaching what could possibly be a national emergency. And so all the military officers were required to turn up for duties on Sabbath. I had been away from the head office on Sabbath at church worshiping. And so I was sent for a Friday morning and ordered to move a convoy of military equipment to Sabbath morning. Hmm. A fellow officer spoke to the commanding officer saying, uh, Alan will not turn up because he's Seventh-day Adventist. That led to a very long discussion back and forth. I was called, scriptures were quoted. Long and short of the story was, I was grounded while in flight school, not being permitted to continue my flight training. Very traumatic experience for me. I had to explain the, our beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists, why it is that I'm away on Sabbath. I was asked if I would be willing to fly the president on Sabbath of the country and I said I will do so if it's a case of emergency. I was told that the president always flew in cases of emergencies. And so as a result of that and not being willing to uh, violate my conscience by turning up for military duties, which I deemed could be carried out by other officers in those days, as a result of that I had to resign from the military, give up my career, the pursuit of my career in terms of a uh, being a pilot and a servant as a military officer. And I was uh, discharged with honors and the military actually said this officer uh, is able to perform and performs his duty well, but loses sight of his career objective because of his religious persuasion. So it was mm -hmm. quite a trying time for me, a painful time in my, in my existence. But during that time, I believe that it was better to follow what I understood the scriptures required to have a day dedicated to the worshiping of God. Mm. And you know, I, and I've always appreciated your, your experience and, and it certainly uh, 
brings to mind something that the courts in Canada have often talked about, and that is that our religious beliefs have consequences. Mm -hmm. And so it may very well be that they cannot be accommodated in, in the particular context in which they find themselves. And so for you, Pastor, you've had to, um, you had to pay a price for your conscience. And what I really also appreciate in that story is the fact that the military saw your conscience as something to be respected in the sense that they gave you uh, on, an honorable discharge. Mm. And that is something that um, in freedom-loving countries, we like to see. Yes. Yes, the individual, uh, we're sorry, we can't pay you the, we, we can't allow you to have that uh, position. And, you know, there's a whole debate as to whether or not they could or couldn't. Uh, but at least they showed some respect there. And I think that's extremely important. And we need to, uh, we need to um, do all we can to foster governments to respecting conscience, even though, you know, there are consequences. We lose our jobs, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that uh, concerns me in the long term with respect to this specific crisis um, is that the longer a crisis uh, continue and the more dire situations become, the more, uh, the more likely uh, people are, the more willing people are to make concessions, to give up certain rights and freedoms for a loaf of bread, so to speak. To, mm -hmm. for, you know, so one of the things that concerns me is that um, a crisis such as this not go on for too long and the situation becomes more dire because as we do that, uh, you will have, uh, in my estimation, um, more willingness overall to sort of uh, invest particular entities with more, more and more power. Um, the, the, the power balance as crises continues, uh, continue is often uh, becomes, power balance often becomes imbalance in my mm. estimation. So mm. I think it's prudent for us to do everything that we can uh, to, to ensure that this pandemic um, dissipates sooner than later. Um, so cooperate with the, the systems that are in place and the instructions that are given, um, you know, insofar as they do not violate our conscience, of course. But again, mm. the, 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 the long-term effect of crisis can be, can be very dire and, and bring about some concessions that we normally wouldn't make in, in, in times of peace. Yes. Yeah. And, it, and it so is a, he, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I was just going to say that even if we do make those concessions uh, on a short-term basis, um, we got to be very mindful that uh, government wouldn't want us to keep those concessions mm -hmm. on indefinitely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes. That's the that's the important uh, and and the struggle of, like you know of people of conscience who who um, are struggling and and uh with respect to it but we need to respect them even though they've made a decision on conscience but yet um we may not as a society be able to agree with it yes uh, but we still respect them and i think that's important because otherwise if we don't respect then violence happens and then that's that puts us down a whole new road that we never want to go mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is an exceptional case that we're le living in right now, but we have to be careful it doesn't become the norm. And, uh, and then we, we're just giving in and we're getting used to that. Um, but keeping in mind, uh, there is something of you know, this, this vigilance that we must maintain that we, as children of God, we, uh, we have a conscience and we have individual freedom of choice. We've, we've come to the end of our time, um, and we, I, would, I, I guess there's a lot more that we can, be, can be said on this, and maybe we should, we should uh, look, look at more on this topic. And so if those who are watching would like to add to the discussion, um, add by putting in the comments there or sending an email to It Is Written Canada. Um, you can also communicate with me on It Is Written Canada's uh, Instagram uh and you know follow us there as well mm -hmm. so. and make comments in the youtube mm -hmm. um channel too at mm -hmm. the bottom there's a place where you can comment mm -hmm. 
or add to the discussion, like Mark said. So gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us and for being with us today in this situation. And I think we also have to remember that we do have hope and that ultimately God is in control. Mm -hmm. And so we, we can't become fearful mm -hmm. to the point where fear absolutely paralyzes us. Mm -hmm. But we need to, um, to know that God is in control. Mm -hmm. And if he's in control, he's the ultimate power and he can be trusted with that. Mm -hmm. And that God never, even with all the power that he has, and he has absolute power, he never compels the obedience of men. He leaves all free to choose whom they will serve. Mm -hmm. So, um, Barry, I wonder if you could close with a word of prayer for us. Sure. Sure. Father, as we enter in and as we are now currently in a moment of crisis, not only a crisis in this country, but a crisis around the world. Mm -hmm. We ask and pray, Lord, that you will be with all of the leaders whom you have put in charge, that you will give them wisdom, be with the scientists, be with the physicians who are and nurses and all of the healthcare staff who are dealing with uh, people in a day-to-day -day basis who are suffering through this uh, coronavirus. Lord, we pray and ask for your Holy Spirit to continue to be with them and guide them and give them all that they need and help us as your followers to support and to uh, do all that we can to ensure that this pandemic is over sooner than later. Uh -huh. And at the same time, I pray, Lord, that you will give us wisdom to be ever mindful of the importance of uh, keeping e eternal, eternally vigilant uh -huh. with respect to the freedom that we have to follow our conscience. And so, Lord, we pray and ask that you will be with those who've gained power as a result of this crisis that would voluntarily relinquish that power in the name of freedom is our prayer. Mm -hmm. And so, Lord, be with each one on this call, every family represented. Be with all of the people across this land that you will show us that even in something that happens that is bad, you will turn it into good is our prayer in your name. Amen. 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 Thank you for your prayer. Barry, um, I just want to remind you, friends, of the words of Jesus where he said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God.